India has downplayed the impact of U.S. plans to end New Delhi's preferential trade status that allows duty-free access to products worth $5.6 billion. Saying that India has not assured the United States that it will provide equitable and reasonable access to its markets, U.S. President Donald Trump has directed the U.S. Trade Representative's office to remove India from a program that grants it preferential trade treatment. In 2017, India was the biggest beneficiary of the Generalized System of Preferences, GSP, which lowers duties on exports from about 120 developing countries. The Indian Commerce Secretary told reporters in New Delhi that India has no plans to impose retaliatory tariffs on U.S. goods. Face waited Monday for the results of an election called a return to democratic rule, but which has been widely criticized as an exercise designed by Prime Minister Prayat Chan Ocha to entrench his military stranglehold on power. Preliminary official results released late Sunday showed that with 93% of ballots counted the military-backed Falling Pracharat party was in the lead with about 7.6 million votes, that's short of what would be needed for a majority in parliament. In second place was the Fiu Thai party of former Prime Minister Vanessa with 7.1 million votes. The campaign was marred by allegations of vote buying, however, complaints were few on polling day with election observers from Australia, Canada, the United States and the 10 members of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations on hand. A waterproof drone is being used by Australian scientists to collect the highly treasured nasal mucus of migrating whales. The snot is rich with fresh DNA, viruses and bacteria, and is collected by a drone that hovers over the blowholes of humpback whales as they embark on their epic annual journey along Australia's east coast. From Sydney, Phil Mercer reports, whales, like all mammals need air, and come to the surface to breathe through a blowhole. Vanessa Parada, a marine biologist at Macquarie University, says that nasal mucus indicates the health of the whale. Millions of people in North Korea are short of food, perpetually hungry children and pregnant and nursing mothers are suffering the most. The World Food Program reports, South Korea's landmark donation, the biggest in more than a decade, will help ease the nutritional crisis faced by two million of this particularly vulnerable group of people. Under an agreement worked out by WFP between both countries, South Korea will donate 50,000 metric tons of rice and $4.5 million in cash for food needs in North Korea. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo met with Indian Foreign Secretary in Washington Monday and told him that the United States stands with India in fighting terrorism. After their meeting, the State Department said the two discussed the importance of bringing to justice those responsible for a suicide attack on an Indian paramilitary convoy claimed by Pakistan-based militants. The State Department said the diplomats spoke of the urgency of Pakistan taking meaningful action against terrorist group operating on its soil. Last month, a suicide bomber killed 40 Indian paramilitary troops in a convoy in the disputed Kashmir region. A Pakistan-based militant group claimed responsibly for that violence. New Delhi has vowed to punish Islamabad for sheltering the militants, saying the Indian Army chief has been given a free hand to take whatever action is required.
Touchdown confirmed. We are safe on Mars. The control room at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory late in the evening of August 5th, Pacific Time, when word arrived that the Curiosity rover had landed safely on Mars. The one-ton rover, which dwarfs all Mars landers that came before it, will now spend a planned two years exploring the Martian surface. The mission is expected to cost $2.5 billion. Curiosity's task is to investigate the inside of Gale Crater, where a giant mound of sedimentary deposits may provide evidence of a wetter, possibly habitable Mars billions of years ago. But first it had to survive an elaborate landing sequence which appears to have gone smoothly. Curiosity landed on time and on target and soon beamed back grainy photos of its wheels and its shadow. Given the car-like size of the rover and the challenges of landing on Mars, Curiosity's landing goes down as one of the greatest parking jobs in history. Barred owls can be found in dense forests right across North America. They feed on small mammals, fish, birds and small reptiles, pretty much anything that comes their way. The barred owl grows up to half a meter tall and has emerged as a very adaptable nocturnal predator. Whereas they have been long thought to live in old-growth forests, they are now building up quite an urban population. In Charlotte's, North Carolina, Barred owls tend to nest in the cavities of the numerous willow oak trees that line the city's streets. Far from being endangered, the owls have expanded their range, and now, in some places, conservationists are worried about the effects they might have on other native species. Almost everyone has heard of the London Stock Exchange, but relatively few know anything about the London metal and commodity exchanges. Yet these markets have a greater influence on world economies because they set global prices for some of the essential raw materials for industry and food manufacture. The LME provides three basic services to the world's non-ferrous metal trade. First, it is a market where large or small quantities of metal of a guaranteed minimum standard can be bought and sold on specific trading days. Second, it acts as a barometer of world metal prices. And third, it is a hedging medium. That is, it can help traders get some protection from price fluctuations that occur for economic, political or financial reasons. An important question about education is, then, why do some types of students achieve success easily and others struggle to do well? Well, one theory is that there is a genetic reason for academic achievement. What I mean by that is, a certain innate, measurable level of intelligence. Another frequently discussed theory is environmental factors, such as the effect of home and family upbringing. A final reason is related to the teaching and learning process within educational institutions, and the way it is organized, administered and assessed. I'd recommend that you all try to get hold of English in the Southern Hemisphere by Nallon and Watts, as this provides an excellent overview for the topics that we're going to be covering in this module. It's really our primary text. It has particularly strong sections on the history of English in Australia and New Zealand, examining in some depth how the language has developed in these countries. The sections on phonology and on vocabulary will be invaluable when you're doing the written assignment, which I'm going to be telling you about in a moment once I've given you the details of a couple of other essential references.
Learning a language in the classroom is never easy and, quite frankly, it's not the way that most people would choose to learn if they had other options. Having said that, there are plenty of reasons for keeping languages on the school curriculum. For one thing, a fair number of students go on to take jobs in business and commerce that require a basic knowledge of a second language. When you talk to young employees in top companies, it seems that they had a career plan from the start, they were motivated to find additional things to put on their CVs, and of course language is one of those added, but significant extras. The assignment that I'm going to set for the holiday period is one that we've given students for a number of years. It's quite practical and will allow you to get out and about, it's no good being shut up in your rooms all the time. It does have a written element, too. Um, basically it's a data gathering exercise and there are two choices with regard to how you collect the data. We'll go through those in a moment. I'm also going to give you a link to an internet site that is, well it's critical that you review this before you do anything as it provides a lot of guidance on data presentation, both in terms of how you plot it, its diagrammatic form and also its description, which has to be clear. We've decided to adopt just as a loose theme for the course, a biological theme so that you can see the connections between chemistry and biology and the things that you might consider doing in the future. We want you to think about the molecules that are relevant to your body, the processes that occur in your body, the chemistry that's going on and how energy plays a role. And we divided the course into four sections and after each section there will be a midterm. The first one, or an exam. The first one is about matter. In February 2016, as infection moved rapidly through the range occupied by AEDs mosquitoes in the Americas, WHO declared that Zika infection associated with microcephaly and other neurological disorders constituted a public health emergency of international concern. By the start of February 2016, local transmission of Zika infection had been reported from more than 20 countries and territories in the Americas and an outbreak numbering thousands of cases was underway in Cabo Verde in Western Africa. Health education intervention programs are currently available to improve cognitive understanding of the importance of adopting certain dietary and physical activity behaviors and lifestyle choices. The aims of such programs are to improve health. The Coronary Health Improvement Project is a health education intervention that teaches people the importance of making better choices in nutrition, physical activity, and tobacco in order to prevent, arrest and even reverse coronary heart disease. The principles of integrated nursing advocate that food be considered as a primary intervention for health promotion, risk reduction and generally improved well-being. Food provides information to the body, signaling basic biological functions and normalizing physiological processes. Healthcare professionals should query patients about their nutritional intake, recognizing that adjustments in the types of foods consumed can often address long-standing symptoms that create distress, including pain, fatigue, anxiety, and gastrointestinal dysfunction.
The Brazilian educator and influential theorist Paulo Freire has convinced me that scholarship is a dialogical process. According to Freire, the contributions of one scholar have no meaning if they stand alone. The value of any work becomes apparent only when that work dialogues with the work that has gone before. For this reason, we do literature reviews. For this reason, we include in our manuscripts an implications section. One seminal difference in policy remains, the coalition has not matched what is Labour's most important innovation promise. That is to bring together responsibilities for innovation, industry, science and research under one single federal minister. Innovation responsibilities currently lie within the powerful Department of Education and Science, and while there is a separate industry department, it has little influence within Cabinet. This has hampered policy development and given Australia's innovation policies a distinctly science and research bias. It is the scientists rather than the engineers who call the tune in innovation policy in Canberra, so it's no surprise our policies are all about boosting government-funded research and later commercializing their results. Milk production, that is, lactation, is a major component of reproduction in mammals. In contrast to all other animals, mammals including primitive mammals, such as the duckbill platypus and the spiny anteater nourish their offspring with a liquid that is secreted by specialized glands. Milk production and secretion are complex, multi-stage processes that are controlled by several hormones, the most important of which are prolactin and oxytocin. There are few studies on research training programs within the realm of Asian American health disparities. The existing literature on training programs tends to emphasize broad components such as mentorship and an examination of the community and academic partnership. Moreover, the current available literature pertains mostly to clinical practitioners such as nurses and doctors in residency rather than researchers. Few articles employed quantitative evaluation methods because most of these evaluations were limited to a low number of participants. Group-based microfinance schemes attempt to harness the collective power of mutual support with members pooling their savings and making small loans to each other so that they can set up small businesses. Most aim to improve the economic power of and employment opportunities for women in their immediate community, and many aim to confront ingrained discriminatory attitudes to women. Some aim to facilitate the attendance of girls at school and change attitudes to the paid employment of women outside their homes. Menopause is characterized by greatly diminished levels of a group of steroid reproductive hormones called estrogens. Estrogens travel through the bloodstream and exert widespread physiological effects on organ growth and development. Approximately 25% of postmenopausal women take supplemental estrogens to alleviate unpleasant symptoms of menopause, a practice called hormone replacement therapy. For example, HRT decreases the risk of cardiovascular disease and osteoporosis but may increase the risk of cancer. The Czech Republic currently is undergoing transformation from the centralized regime of a communist dictatorship towards a modern democratic state. 
Fonta et al. recognizes three main events in the last half century that had profound consequences for the country and its land use. First, the communist coup d'état and the following collectivization of land in the 1950s that introduced large-scale collective farming. Second, the abolition of the totalitarian political system in 1989, which was followed by the restitution of private land ownership in the 1990. Although Oyakawa is much too young to have been directly affected by the expulsion of the Japanese Canadians from the Pacific coast, her anger at the treatment they endured during and immediately after the Second World War is apparent in the very use of the word violence in the title. Calling them euphemisms, she rejects such terms as interior housing centers, and sugar beet projects. The editors hold that if identity politics has no preordained political effects, then to a significant degree, the risks and dilemmas of identity politics signal not a failure of identity politics per se but a failure of states to democratize their political processes. They find this to be especially true of liberal democracies, where open political space for an engaged citizenry requires public institutions that possess the capacity determination to develop procedures and guidelines for addressing claims in ways that are compatible with the rule of law, constitutional principles, and public reason. Barred owls can be found in dense forests right across North America. They feed on small mammals, fish, birds and small reptiles, pretty much anything that comes their way. The barred owl grows up to half a meter tall and has emerged as a very adaptable nocturnal predator. Whereas they have been long thought to live in old-growth forests, they are now building up quite an urban population. In Charlottes, North Carolina, barred owls tend to nest in the cavities of the numerous willow oak trees that line the city's streets. Far from being endangered, the owls have expanded their range, and now, in some places, conservationists are worried about the effects they might have on other native species. Almost everyone has heard of the London Stock Exchange, but relatively few know anything about the London Metal and Commodity Exchanges. Yet these markets have a greater influence on world economies because they set global prices for some of the essential raw materials for industry and food manufacture. The LME provides three basic services to the world's non-ferrous metal trade. First, it is a market where large or small quantities of metal of a guaranteed minimum standard can be bought and sold on specific trading days. Second, it acts as a barometer of world metal prices. And third, it is a hedging medium. That is, it can help traders get some protection from price fluctuations that occur for economic, political or financial reasons. An important question about education is, then, why do some types of students achieve success easily and others struggle to do well? Well, one theory is that there is a genetic reason for academic achievement. What I mean by that is, a certain innate, measurable level of intelligence. Another frequently discussed theory is environmental factors, such as the effect of home and family upbringing. A final reason is related to the teaching and learning process within educational institutions, and the way it is organized, administered and assessed.
I'd recommend that you all try to get hold of English in the Southern Hemisphere by Nallon and Watts, as this provides an excellent overview for the topics that we're going to be covering in this module. It's really our primary text. It has particularly strong sections on the history of English in Australia and New Zealand, examining in some depth how the language has developed in these countries. The sections on phonology and on vocabulary will be invaluable when you're doing the written assignment, which I'm going to be telling you about in a moment once I've given you the details of a couple of other essential references. Learning a language in the classroom is never easy and, quite frankly, it's not the way that most people would choose to learn if they had other options. Having said that, there are plenty of reasons for keeping languages on the school curriculum. For one thing, a fair number of students go on to take jobs in business and commerce that require a basic knowledge of a second language. When you talk to young employees in top companies, it seems that they had a career plan from the start. They were motivated to find additional things to put on their CVs, and of course language is one of those added, but significant extras.